We are so excited to have Kay Taylor with us today. Kay is also on the Kepler College board, so she's part of our, our family. Kay is a soul-centered psychological astrologer, author, and teacher who has been integrating evolutionary astrology with intuitive mastery, psychosynthesis, yoga philosophy, and healing wisdom for 40 years. Kay is the president of OPA, which is the Organization for Professional Astrology, she, formerly the education director over there, and as I said, she's on our board. She's a respected conference lecturer and trains intuitive astrology, astrologers excuse me, through her Soul Path School. Her publications include The Soul Path Way, which was published in 2016, and chapters for The Professional Astrologer and Essential Astrology. She's certified by OPA. Eyes are cap and NCGR level two, and she maintains a thriving full-time consulting practice in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her website is ktaylor.com. And without further ado, I am going to stop sharing and hand it over to you, Kay. Thank you so much thank for being here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. And I also want to thank everybody for being here. Let me get, whoa, I need to go back. There we go to the opening slide. So here we are. And again, I want to thank everybody for showing up today. I know we're in holiday season and there's a million things everybody can do. So to have a live in-person audience, you know, feeds the energy and is amazing. And as you know, this class is meant to be a little taste of some key aspects of what we'll be going through in the consulting skills training that starts in January. And I'm going to share a lot of information with you today. And I'll also tell you, though, that the difference between this and the class is in the class, there's a lot of experiential work and going deeper and truly embodying all of the concepts that we'll consider on a more theoretical or philosophical level today. I have been, as you saw, I've been doing this astrological uh, counseling kind of work now for 40 years. And things like power dynamics in the astrology session are certainly not anything that is normally taught. And in fact, you know, many of us, we start learning just through books and we're not taught anything about how to work with clients. Since OPA is, uh, does a lot of work and kind of uh, like Donna Young, the president of Kepler, says we're the finishing school for Kepler. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work to help astrologers launch and expand and be professional in their business. And we saw very quickly in the peer group trainings that we have that the consultation skills, the understanding of power dynamics and language and so many things that people take for granted are often not well understood by astrologers. And that's why OPA makes uh, a big point of teaching consulting skills. And we brought that program to Kepler, although at Kepler we're expanding it in terms of um, some of the, the depth processes that we'll be able to do in a 10-week course. So let's let's dive in. And I'm going to start with the question, is this for you? Is this training for you? Do you need to even be here in this Power Dynamics webinar? And I would say absolutely yes. Certainly, if you are a professional astrologer or you're a student and you want to be an astrologer, um, to, to understand power and how it is affecting your session and the people that you're working with. But even if you are a client, even if you are somebody who's just going to see astrologers, psychics, hypnotherapists, anybody mm, that you work with in a way where one person has expertise and information and supposedly professionalism to know that there's a lot of subconscious beliefs subconscious biases sometimes uh, energies just the literal energy of what goes on with power dynamics with people and 
So to be here and to grapple with this topic and try to understand a little bit more about it and bring more awareness and consciousness and maybe different kinds of languaging and actions, uh, this is this is I think very essential for uh, everybody uh, on either side of the table or either side of the Zoom screen or the computer, wherever it is that you are having a session. Now, one of the things that caused me personally to think a lot about the quality of consulting skills and how people give astrology readings is that forever, when people come in to me for their first session, I always ask, have you ever had an astrology reading before? And right now, I'm going to ask you all to sit there and think about the astrology readings you've had and which ones you felt were really great and which ones you felt weren't so great or maybe even sometimes harmful. But I'll tell you the classic answer, almost like everybody had memorized it from a book. I have heard so many times, well, I had one reading or three readings or a few readings a long time ago. And frankly, I didn't really understand most of it at the time. And I've forgotten it. And that's that's just a real terrible thing for us as astrologers. Uh, it should not that should not be the answer you get. You know, you should get the answer of yes, I had a reading. I had great readings. I had a lot of them. They, you know, guided my life, and I learned so much about myself, and I was able to apply it, and it made my life better. Because those of us who love astrology, we know that that's what is possible. We know that. The astrology can give us this amazing guiding map. But if we're not able to bring the information across in a way that the person can receive it and understand it and remember it, then we're not really doing our job. I think one of the reasons that this happens is that because so many astrologers were not trained, and it's really relatively recently, right, that we have schools like Kepler and uh, trainings that go much deeper. But if you just started reading astrology books in your back bedroom and then maybe took an online course or back in the day a, a written correspondence course, and you got to the point where Somebody said, yeah, you know enough, or you decided you know enough, and you, um, or, or maybe you got some kind of certification, and it was like, okay, now I'm an astrologer, and everybody comes to that point, right, where you say, I'm hanging my shingle up, now I'm an astrologer. Most people, astrologers and the clients that come to see us, had the, the idea, kind of like fortune telling and psychic kinds of, of ideas that the astrologer should just give us this monologue that the, the good astrologer is somebody who reads the chart and tells you everything about you and is absolutely perfect. And, and you can say, oh, they were right on the money. They hit it right on. And it's so exciting that it's so good. And, and we all had that, that fundamental unconscious belief about what astrology was supposed to be and then as psychology and astrology started integrating a little bit more the the idea that you know maybe there should be more conversation maybe there's a a little bit of a give and take but these ideas kind of you know don't go away very easily and many clients are afraid that if they give too much information if they ask you a detailed question that you'll just you know do the old trickaroo and you'll just take what they said in the question and turn it around and feed it back to them and that actually you don't know what you're doing but of course we know as astrologers that we do know what we're doing and we have this amazing map of a person's life in in holographic perfection but we we don't always know exactly how they're living the chart out because we have 
uh, a range of expression of the planets, the signs, even the aspects, and to have some level of interaction with the person, which brings us into a little more equality and not just in we're the powerful God, you know, divining and saying, this is who you are and this is what will happen to you. If we are able to have more of a true sense of equality with the person, then we get out of this old fashioned framework of the astrologer as, you know, the, the, the one that, that knows everything. Why a duck? Well, when you're doing your monologue to your client and they're sitting in their chair with their hands folded and looking at you and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, nodding their head or maybe looking bleary eyed at the screen, they are like a little duck with their feet paddling under the water furiously. They're afraid. You just told them that Pluto's going into their fifth house of children. And you're like, they're like, what does that mean? What's going to happen to my children? You know, the archetypal energy of Pluto comes in the room and they are in fear. Or you start throwing around planets and aspects and a few asteroids and you're looking all cool because you know all these technical terms and they're trying to figure it out and their mind is swirling in overtime as their feet are paddling and they're trying to look cool and like they know what's going on and they don't hear anything you say for the next 10 minutes. So this monologue way of doing things, this empowered, um, what do I want to use up? Because it's not empowered, but it it is the 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 sense of the astrologer has all the power, sets the astrologer up to be either a hero or a failure, and what comes from this is that. You know, you'll have people come back to you and they are saying, uh, well, you know, you told me and that can go two ways, right? It can go, you told me that on the 15th of December, I was going to meet the love of my life. And lo and behold, you know, I walked into the grocery store and there they were. And you are so right. You are amazing. Oh, my God. You know, so there's the hero. But they can also say, you know, you told me I would meet the love of my life on December 15th and now it's December 20th and I haven't met anybody and, you know, I'm just wondering if, you know, you're really a charlatan. So you get into this place with dramatic, detailed predictions that don't really come into the understanding of, you know, the full picture or that person's life that that really are kind of a setup. The other thing that can happen is that we can have clients that are working at very high levels of consciousness and the negative things you've learned about how certain aspects play out are actually not happening to them at all. And vice versa, I find sometimes I might imagine somebody who is uh, way more uh, evolved than the way that they are and what they're doing and the some of the more esoteric spiritual meanings that I think are important for them to know about are really not what they're interested in they just want to know am I going to get this job should I buy this house so you know we we need to make sure that the client feels seen and and that goes to interpretation errors that if we have no real understanding of who this person is. And remember the astrology chart in front of you can be the chart of a person. It can be a dog, a set of puppies that was born. It could be a business that started that day. We need to have at least the core level information to be able to read a chart well and not have interpretation errors. Mm. And as we're in this hero role, we might feel like we have to do these big fateful pronouncements, uh, which, by the way, can also be self-fulfilling prophecies. If we believe in the metaphysical spiritual concept that we are always creating our life by thoughts, words, and actions, then 
when we tell somebody as if we are the expert that something is going to happen and they believe it and then they don't do the things they would have done they it, that can be sabotaged but you know more likely what often happens is if we say to somebody well you'll never get married or you'll never have a relationship or you'll never have money or something like that that unfortunately i hear those kinds of things all the time i have people and any astrologer in business for any length of time. We have the cleanup work. We have the people who come in who have been told these horrible, negative absolutes about what won't happen. And, you know, for instance, I recently uh, met someone who was told in her 20s that she would never be married and never have children. And so she decided just not to date. For 10 years, she just said, well, it's hopeless. And the astrologer told me this. I mean, this is a real example of a self-fulfilling prophecy in action. And so when we're trying to be this, this major perfect expert uh, doing the monologue, it's tremendous pressure on us. And in the end, it ends up being very inauthentic. Because what's actually going on in this kind of situation is that we are embodying a toxic power dynamic where the astrologer is the expert and knows everything and the client is uh, the, the person who just has to sit there and take it and live the life that they are being told they have. So why is there this power in the astrology session? It starts, it arises from the fact that information is power, right? How many times have you heard that? Information is power. Astrologers, we have specialized knowledge. We have so much knowledge that honestly, people should not give us their birth data unless they want us to know a lot about them, right? Well, many people have no idea when they give you their birth data how much you're going to know and and so that automatically bestows this this unspoken power to us uh and we can uh, you know in the session we can use this information we have to be influential and to be controlling and also the client may have a tendency to want to give up their power to us and allow us to control and influence. The, uh, the client may also have, as many of us do, given the imprinting we have in society, the client may have a fear of being judged and therefore that's the duck paddling. They, they don't want to tell you what's really going on and what they really feel or that they don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, they may have a need for unhealthy dependencies or a history of disempowerment. And so their history and their personality energy comes in in that way. And the astrologer may lack healthy power and ethics and boundaries and awareness and consciousness. No, this is not necessarily something that we've studied in our astrology training, as I've said, and it may not be anything that we have studied elsewhere. Like maybe that's not what we did in college, or maybe we didn't do a lot of therapy yet and started to understand from that relationship uh, what happens in an uneven power dynamic. And on top of it, we have the fact that power dynamics are systemic. And we live in this framework where there is a lot of uh, cultural oppression built into the system. So as astrologers, in terms of working with power, we need to go beyond just the one-on-one -on -one and understand a little bit more that, first of all, bottom line, we're here to do no harm. We need to respect our client's identity and values and be able to work with empathy and compassion and solidarity for what people are going through. It's very important 
that we are of service and skillful in the way that we that we see what people are experiencing uh, in their past, in their culture, in their life, and that we don't simply hold whatever cultural belief system or experience or privilege we came from. All of these issues on this slide, all oppression is based on lies. All of these various kinds of conscious or subconscious bias that people could have. Uh, this is coming up in your astrology session, whether you realize it or not. And this is an area that we delve deep in the consulting skills course because it's it's not enough to just say, oh, well, I don't think I'm racist or I don't think I'm ageist or whatever. And yet so often there's aspects that are below the surface that we don't quite see. And it comes out in our sessions with the way we interpret things, the way that, and I've, I've seen this in some of the astrological literature where some astrologers uh, who are, you know, on some level have some racism or some homophobia, the way they interpret somebody's chart, it leaks through in the words they use and the interpretations. You know, as I said, you know, you can look at a planet in a sign in a house and there's a whole range of how that will play out. And a lot of it depends on you as the astrologer and how you feel about that person and what your perspective is of that person. And here again is the power, right? You're holding the power to look at the chart and interpret it according to your bias, according to your personal experience. So what are we going to do about all of this? We're going to start to look at how, how we can make these changes to balance the power dynamics and one of the first ways to do this is to kind of understand, you know, some of the energetic patterns and the way that they're discussed uh, in, in places that relate more to the counseling situation. Now, this first one is one that uh, we, we think is really relevant to astrologers. So astrologers can kind of hold this in their mind when they're working with people. And that is ideally when we see ourselves as the partner in an astrology session, then it is a first house, seventh house, equal perspective. We are partners with the person. We have this special skill and knowledge, and we're there to impart that to them, but we honor and value them as a full human with agency over their lives. And we don't have this sense that it's 10th house, 4th house. 10th house, we're in charge. We're the boss. 4th house, they're the child. They're little. They don't know anything. We're the expert. And, you know, they're supposed to just go along and do what we tell them to do. No, we are, we are meant to be equals. And so holding this chart in your mind and thinking about that is a great way uh, to to start to hold the energies because our our psyche loves pictures, right? Our our psyche, our subconscious speaks in pictures, and this is a good picture to hold in your mind about mm, how you want to be. Again, whether you are the astrologer or you find yourself in an astrology session, and if you find yourself in an astrology session where the astrologer is kind of wagging their finger at you and telling you that they know best and you should do this and you should do that and shaming you or belittling you, then you, you are in the wrong place. The second way of looking at power dynamics in a session uh, comes from the Karpman drama triangle, which is something that's taught to psychotherapists. And in this way of looking at things, we see that uh, a person may uh, be the victim 
And maybe this is some, you know, they come into the therapy session with this approach, you know, like life is really hard and people are doing these things to me and I'm helpless to change it. I'm blaming, you know, my family of origin and the culture and the people who are harming me. And if, if the counselor, and this can be you as the astrologer, if you jump in as the rescuer, then you feel good about yourself and you feel like you're being helpful and you're facilitating things and you like that you're being needed, but you might be prone to meddling too much and engulfing and, you know, becoming in some way the victim yourself over time. And when that happens, then it's likely that the tables turn and now the client will shift uh, and, you know, they will feel like you are, uh, you are harming them and they become the persecutor and they start, uh, you know, to be angry and aggressive and judgmental and bullying. And, and so any one of these points <laughs> is not healthy. You obviously, you don't want to be a victim powerless, but you don't want to take on false power as a rescuer. And the potential for this moving into anger and it shifting around uh, where the you know victim becomes the the angry persecutor, we need to throw this whole triangle really out and come into what I call the psychosynthesis triangle because it's what I learned in studying for many years, the spiritual psychology of psychosynthesis, which, holds at a core that we are all full beings when we're born and that the agenda of well-meaning parents, teachers, and the culture, if not outright abuse and neglect, causes us to form sub-personalities, uh, coping mechanisms, inner parts that uh, are trying to accommodate what's being asked in the outside environment. And in this way of looking at things energetically, we have a triangle where on the bottom, we have the client and the astrologer equal across from each other. And then at the top, we have spirit or oneness. We have that source energy that we're all connected into. And when the astrologer holds in their heart that they are in fact, operating from that same flow of spirit and oneness that the client is, that at that place, there is absolute oneness and equality, then that balances the interaction automatically. Because again, it just becomes that the client is a whole perfect being at a soul level. And you as the astrologer, have this knowledge that you can impart to the client and the client knows their path. The client knows who they really are. And in absorbing that information you're giving them, it allows them to resonate with their truth. And I always say this about a good reading. So many times in after a session, a person can say, well, you know, I really knew all you told me, you know, it really resonated. Maybe there's some new things. Maybe there's some things that are down the road that they don't quite see yet. But the, the deepest important impact in the client session is the client knows their essential truth, the truth of who they are as a soul, what their path is, what the next steps are, but all the shoulds and shouldn'ts weaving around in the mind, all the confusion and the doubt, the astrologer with high level, accurate, truthful information can give a gift to the client that dissolves a lot of those doubts and those confusions. And the client can then feel in alignment with their truth and move forward. And this comes from the astrologer not trying to be in this superpower role, but instead wanting to be in this place of equality with the imparting of sacred wisdom.
So we come into the next section where we talk a little bit more about language and the energetic sensitivities and the emotional flavor of what we're what we're about here. Words have power. I mentioned it early, but this deserves its own moment, its own slide to say, avoid fateful predictions and wording that seems absolute. You will have this, you will never have that. You know, it's a curse on a person to say you will never have these things that you want. And one of the things that I challenge all of you as astrologers to is no matter how great you are in your astrology and how much you've studied and what amazing techniques that you're using. And I know that there are incredible detailed forecasting techniques in traditional and Hellenistic astrology, in Geotish, uh, the harmonics. I mean, I, I'm amazed by many of these aspects. And yet there's very little research, very little. Uh, we have some new research coming out that's quite compelling, but it's not 100%. There's a few really good computer-based astrologers who are doing the research. And they're often finding that the things we've always believed to be true, the classic astrology that's been passed down, for instance, that the best relationships are the sun in the same sign as the other person's moon, like that actually isn't holding up in the research. But we don't we don't have the kind of statistics that doctors have. I, I wish we did. I wish we could say, you know, with Pluto square Mars, there's a 45% chance that you're going to have this, that, and the other. And, you know, but there, oh, there's that wonderful, you know, Venus trine Jupiter, and there's a 92% this is going to happen. We don't have that. Well, there's such a range and it's such a complex chart altogether that in order not to um, harm people with self-fulfilling prophecies, restrictions, unrealistic expectations, we need to bring our words forward in the ways that allow a person to feel empowered, to say, this is what sometimes happens with this. I imagine that this could be, you know, uh, what could be coming up at this particular date. Uh, how do you feel about that? What was your experience of the last time this transit happened? That was in 1992. Do you remember what happened then? Because this is related. Like this is where the interaction with the client, the trusting them and not feeling like we have to be so perfect uh, helps us and helps them. And this is a related slide. <laughs> I loved the visual. I wanted you to have this visual so that, that this is going to relate to avoiding the disempowering fear-based interpretations. So the last slide was really about how do you word things you have? This is more like, are you afraid of astrology and astrological transits? Are you afraid of what you think are bad charts? Are you a person who's gonna say, oh my God, this is the worst chart I've ever seen or you are in the worst time period you could ever be in in your life. It's like, be careful. Be careful of what you are saying. And, you know, this, again, this, this map is sacred. You're holding this person's karmic life plan in your hands. And it is very important that you treat it with respect and love and care and compassion. And everybody has the chart that is the perfect chart for them. It's like, this is the chart that embodies their soul at that moment of birth. This is the karma that's ripening. This is why they're here now. And our job is to help them be empowered and to understand 
where their gifts and challenges are. And yes, when certain time periods might happen where things are a certain way, but we're here to help them get through it because they're here in this life. They need to get through it and they need to do the best possible with the tools that they have. And there's something beneficial in everything. You know, often say, you know, people will say, oh, well, this uh, Mars is debilitated because it's in Libra. Well, it's a perfect Mars if you're a negotiator. Uh, if you have Mars in Aries, that's great if you're an athlete or, you know, a racing car driver, but that's not necessarily the best for a whole lot of activities in life. So nothing is perfect and nothing is terrible. Now, here's another piece about the emotions and how we approach things. And this is something we can learn to do. And that's to understand the difference between sympathy, empathy, and codependence. Because many times people get confused. So sympathy is when we feel pity for a person. We feel sorry for them. This embodies the 10-4 relationship. And what happens is the person feels ashamed and less than, uh, disempowered. And you as the, you know, astrologer or even in your friendships, uh, your family, you become very drained and lose perspective when you have sympathy and pity for people. It's like if you want to do astrology work and see enough clients in a day that you can live, you know, make a living from doing it. You can't afford to take on everybody's energy and, and feel sorry for them and be worried about them, you know, days after you have the session. You have to be in the moment with them in a heart-centered place, but trust that they are they are living their life and they have or will find the tools they need. Now, codependence is kind of related to this because here we have the concept of taking care of people in a way that is harmful to our own life. So we're focusing on other people's problems, not our own problems. And we see codependence very strongly uh, when people have addictions uh, or poor mental health or just plain immature and irresponsible and understanding our tendency toward that and finding a way to have healthy boundaries is a significant part of what we need to do as, as astrologers. We cannot be taking care of everybody we're talking to. The solution, of course, is empathy, real empathy, which is the ability to understand people's feelings as best we're able and share the feelings. And this doesn't mean we're going to jump in and say, oh, the same thing happened to me last year. My partner left me. And, you know, I understand exactly how you feel. We can show that empathy without interfering in their emotional moment. You know, we can just say, I understand. We can hold the vibration of caring and empathy in our hearts when we're with them and just be in resonance. And Carl Rogers, famous uh, psychologist, called, uh, you know, what we need to do with our clients is to have unconditional positive regard. Um, in psychosynthesis, we call it empathic love. And when we have this sense, we cultivate this sense toward our clients, we are able to experience real empathy with them and they feel it and they know that we care about them and we're not trying to save them. We're not disrespecting them. We are understanding them and accepting the situation that they're in and again, we, we have our gift to give. We have the information we have to impart. Now, in the consulting skills training, we go in a lot of depth about communication skills. And, uh, you know, even people who feel they're very good, great communicators, it's a little bit different to be in 
uh, this situation where we're trying to communicate back and forth enough to uh, get a sense of equality and the information we need to do our best work. And then we have to be able to make smooth transitions and bring in the astrology data as much as we are able to. So communication skills is a very refined expertise that we need to learn. And these communication skills are a key to relieving the pressure that we can feel when we think we have to be a hero. And here I'll say that I noticed years ago when I would go to astrology conferences that I'd be sitting at tables with people and when I would ask them how many, you know, how long they had been studying astrology, invariably there were a lot of people who would say 15 years, 20 years, 25 years they've been studying astrology. Are they seeing clients? No, they don't feel ready yet. They don't feel ready. They're still studying. They're still going to conferences. And one of the reasons that people don't feel ready is because they've got that hero thing, the monologue, I've got to get in there and nail it. I need to know every kind of astrology there is. So the, the key to relieving the pressure is when we communicate with our client and we find out really why they're here. Even if you've taken an intake form, you get to hear it firsthand and you're in the moment Things may have even changed since they did the intake form. And maybe there's a new major issue that's just come up. And, and we are able to feel much less pressured because it is a partnership that we're in. And they are there with us. This allows us to be authentic. We can say, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, if you don't mind, that takes some extra research. I'm going to do some calculations for you and I'm going to uh, send you an email tomorrow after the session and, and give you that. Like you get to be a real person. And yes, you've done your analysis work. You know a lot of the things you think you're supposed to know to help them with their questions. But you also have this uh, potential to flow with what's actually happening. And this communication process is what a big part of establishing the power balance. Here's just a few active listening tips because active listening is the core of your communication when you're in this empowering way of doing your consultations. So one of the ways is to affirm that you hear what the client is saying. No, you you reflect it back. You say, you say a few words of like, oh yeah, that that's exactly what I heard. Uh, it's important to perceive their real emotions, even if they're not verbalizing them. So you can reflect back to a person you know, I see that you are uh, acting like you, you're you in charge of this whole situation, but I'm wondering if you also feel a little sad about it or angry about it or whatever it is you're feeling. It's like, you know, that also lets them know that you're truly listening to them. And some of that, that emotional energy, if you're an empath, of course, you're feeling it, but you can look at facial expressions and body language and learn to read that and bring that into the consultation. And in your active listing, uh, appropriate eye contact, which, you know, in the past, uh, we might have said, oh, well, make eye contact. Well, sometimes on Zoom, too much eye contact is overwhelming. Some people have neurodiverse ways of being and eye contact is not comfortable for them. Some cultures, Extreme eye contact is not done and it's very uncomfortable. So, you know, you're always paying attention, going back to those slides in the past about all of the different diversity issues. The more you understand about the people that you're talking to and the more awareness you have, the more you can be in a comfortable position with them and invite them into their power in the way that you treat them. 
Another key aspect we work with in the consulting skills is being careful about what kinds of questions you're asking. We want to ask open-ended questions that invite the person to really speak about what's going on, not just yes and no questions normally. Um, but it's really interesting, the word why. And it's recommended that we don't use the word why because why has a certain judgmental blame shame dynamic associated with it. And you can just maybe think back to your mother or other person who was like, why did you do that? And maybe using your full name. And then you'll know why you don't want to use why. So it's like, how did that come about? What were your reasons for this at the time? Uh, where were you when this happened? Okay. And here also is the tricky part that takes us some time to work with and practice, which is integrating the conversation with the astrology. Sometimes it seems like people will really want to talk a lot and we have to check in with them and make sure that's okay. And here, <clears throat> you know, we know that they have paid us to come in and get an astrology reading. So we assume they want the astrology. But um, in checking in with some people, when they're telling me their story of why they came, you know, what's your wish for this session? If I, if I ask most people that, they'll, they'll talk for a few minutes and then we can use transitional phrases and say, oh, well, I think I understand. And it reminds me of what I was noticing in the chart here. And let's talk about this or let's talk about that. Uh, but some people will will keep talking and talking, and after a while, I might say, "Are you know, are you sure that uh, you want to keep telling me the story? I feel like I know enough now to go to the chart. Uh, I don't want you to be disappointed. I won't say all these things at once, but these are many ways you could do it. I don't want you to be disappointed with the recording if you haven't received all the astrology you wanted for this session." And I've literally had people say, no, 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 I want to talk for the whole session. It's important for me to give you all the whole story, and then I'll book another session to come back for the astrology. I mean, that can happen. And you have to decide as a practitioner, are you comfortable with that? But what I would say is that it is the client session. And again, when we are taking ourselves out of the power dynamic, if they want to come in <clears throat> and tell us only the minimal information about their questions, or if they want to come in and talk for half an hour about what's been going on, and that relieves their stress. The fact is many people don't have anybody to talk to. And listening to them empathically is the first time for years, if not ever, that they have had someone truly listen to them. And I find that also when I ask people in the beginning what they wish for the session, if I also tell them ahead of time, you know, uh, while I'm doing the overview of your chart, uh, I welcome your questions. If I'm moving too fast, if you don't understand something or you simply want to reflect on what I'm saying, please, you know, please interrupt. But I will also be checking in with you and I will do that. I will say uh, a few things. I'll say, does this resonate? Uh, you know, does this make sense to you? Or should we go on to the next piece? Uh, and and again, it, it, it allows the conversation to be deep and meaningful and for the person to remember it. Now, 10 tips for healthy boundaries. Ooh. Cute little kitty on the boundary wall. So power dynamics are something for you to consider before, during, and after your session. Every choice you make is part of setting up a healthy practice, healthy consultations. So the first part is going to be your website and your social media. Are you authentic? Are you clear? Do you have integrity in the way that you present yourself? You know, we all want to make ourselves look good, 
but we also want to be honest about who we are and what we're offering. And it's really important that the way you put yourself out there to the clients embodies who you are so that they that first step of them seeing you that way and then contacting you, it feels resonant for them. And that means you make it easy for them to make appointments. These, this day and age, I highly suggest that everybody has online booking uh, because it's easeful, clear, people pay. You don't have to chase after people for the money. They've already paid it and they feel like sure and secure that they have an appointment. Uh, you want people to be able to make an appointment at two in the morning when they can't sleep. So uh, making your appointments easy to make is really worthwhile. Once you're in the session, you need to be present, grounded, and that means a lot of self-care. So you don't want to just like run in the door, uh, kind of a mess, you know, coffee flying around and sit down and not really be ready uh, to to take some deep breaths, meditate, do some yoga stretches, uh, whatever it is that gets you ready is very important to be able to hold the energy for the person. Many times it won't matter. Many times you're, you know, it's just a regular session and everything's easy and everything's fine. But the day that you start a session and that person has just found out that somebody close to them has died or they've just been betrayed and they're an emotional wreck. You have to be grounded to be able to hold the space for that person. And that means that your self-care is an integral part of who you are as an astrologer and everything about self-care, diet, exercise, spirituality, mindfulness, uh, the support you create for yourself in your life, the healings and the readings that you get, uh, this helps you be more healthy in a, in a powerful way. When, when I think of positive power, I think of this is the soul coming into our life and being embodied in our human incarnation. You know, so many times people don't like the word power because they confuse it with control and manipulation. And that's dysfunctional power. That's not real power. And real power comes from you actively paying attention to the state of your body, mind, spirit. When you start the session, probably you have an intake form, the information there, but you'll want a few ice-breaking questions. It can be as simple as, you know, I've I've read your intake form. I know the key questions you have today, but tell me in your own words, what is it you're hoping to get from the session? Do you know why? Why are you really here? Why? Why here? Why now? Kind of um, to invite them to to speak. You'll want to use language appropriate for the client. The the other major ice breaking question I always use is. How much astrology do you know? Just so I can work well with my language. Uh, I feel it's very ideal to minimize astro jargon, even if you're doing a reading for a professional astrologer. Uh, every time we go into the this is square the that, um, it takes us into the head. Whereas what we want to do in being in a really high quality consultation is we want to be heart to heart. We, we want to have that resonation be able to happen for the person and it won't happen if there's too much astrology so <clears throat> every every client is different some will know no astrology at all and you'll have to interpret most of the the session into english so they understand it and and others will know a lot of astrology and you may need to say well this is where i'm getting it from but then you want to speak it you want to talk about it in detail even when somebody knows their own chart really well, when you put your words out there, what it is, the way you see it, the way you word it, the divine presence coming through with maybe a few little creative phrases that you never even thought of before, this is where the information fully lands with your client. 
If you are in doing in-person sessions, make sure that there's water or tea, that they know where the bathroom is, that there's tissues sitting right there if they need them. I think this has been one of the hardest things for me with transitioning to Zoom all the time is that, you know, people often are there at, you know, with their Zoom side and they don't have tissues. And if they start crying, they don't want to get up and leave, but they want the tissues. And there's, there's kind of that mm, uncomfortable, <coughs> excuse me, uncomfortable place. Uh, but if you, if you are working in person, you can kind of set the stage that says it's okay to be emotional. Like being emotional is something that happens in readings. And many times people apologize for crying. Like, no, no need to apologize ever. Now, the act of listening and the skillful transitions, the checking in, the compassion, that's like right in the, the center of everything that we're doing here. To end the session skillfully, you're going to want to, first of all, hold the boundary. It's very easy for people when you're first starting out as an astrologer to give way more time than you've agreed to. You've said it's an hour reading and then you're an hour and a half. Uh, I remember somebody once giving me a reading that was going on past three, four hours. Uh, I thought my brain was going to explode. I had to call it off. Um, I just couldn't do it. Um, but on the other hand, when somebody gives you an hour and a half, you know, they've, they've charged you for an hour and they give you an hour and a half, then the next time you go back, you don't know what it is. Are they going to stop at an hour? Is it an hour and a half? There's, there's an uncomfortable feeling with that. And again, that's a power issue because the person who's the professional is not holding the space. So you want, you want to be as uh, accurate as possible in how much time you offer for how much money and then stick to that amount of time. And it's a good idea to warn the person 10 minutes before whatever feels comfortable for you. Uh, again, now that we're all on Zoom, people are always checking their clocks. I don't find this as much of an issue as it used to be, like they're looking right at the clock on their computer. But <clears throat> if it's if it's an in-person session or they don't have a clock, it's important to say, you know, we're coming to the end of our time here. And uh, I'm wondering if you have a last question or two. And that allows things to wrap up in a skillful, uh, you know, nurturing way. Again, when we're talking about uh, in-person sessions, remember that not everybody loves hugging and touching. So make sure you ask for permission uh, or they come toward you to, to want a hug at the end. Many times, you know, a session has been so deep and close that um, there's a desire to kind of end with a hug, but that doesn't work for everybody. And then follow up. What do you do for follow up? Do you send recordings? If you do, try to send them in a reasonable time. Do you ask for testimonials? How do you do that skillfully? Uh, you know, not demanding, but making it an option for people who want to. Uh, these are just, this is a short list, but, uh, you know, in the full course, we talk about a lot of the ethical issues and the boundary issues that come up to create a very safe, healthy experience uh, for both you as the astrologer and the client. Now, your chart, your style, mm -hmm, your shadow. Okay, this is one of the things we go into in a lot of detail, uh, do some real work on in the, in the course. Uh, and that is, you know, we all have uh, these inner parts, as I talked about from the psychosynthesis philosophies. And we might naturally be a nurturer or want to be the expert or like to control things or like to be perfectionistic or maybe we like to perform. Um, whatever that is, and there's a whole bunch of other inner parts that can come forward in our astrology session, uh, by understanding from your astrology chart, like evaluating your own chart, 
where where you tend to fall, which of these parts are yours. Maybe you've got all of them. Uh, you know, that Cancer Pisces nurturer with a dash of Leo performer and well, maybe a moon in Virgo being perfectionistic. Who knows what you have and how it operates for you. But understanding it and figuring out what your style is your style of being with people, your style of astrology that best suits you, what should you be studying, and where might your shadow come forward and you, you know, feel uncomfortable and need to control things. Understanding this is a big part of this work. It's like we can know that these are issues, but there's also this healing transformative process we can go through so that we can be fully available in a healthy way and not have these parts come forward. So in summary, be aware that power dynamics have a huge impact on your sessions. It's happening whether you realize it or not. Communication is a key how you communicate the words that matter, choosing empathy all the time, you know, holding that space. It's a huge part of the healing potential of astrology. Understanding that every choice you make matters from how you present yourself on social media to what your office looks like, what your background is, your screen, your, your health, how you take care of yourself, how you process your own emotions and understand your own shadow. And ultimately, to me, the greatest uh, enhancement that we can all do and is probably as necessary now with Saturn and Pisces as ever before is that we cultivate conscious consciousness. We, we you know, take our spiritual energy seriously we have a discipline or a practice of what we do it can be walking in nature it can be getting up in the morning and taking some deep breaths looking at the sky it can certainly be all the things we know about with meditation and yoga and um you know our our religions or belief systems whatever it is to bring you into a higher sense of consciousness will help you balance out from any ego tendencies to kind of like being in power and using that power in a harmful way, even if you don't realize you're doing it. So I'm not in charge of the questions. I know that the questions are going to be asked of me. Here's my closing slide. If you want to connect with me, I've got a lot of classes starting in January, including the Kepler class. I have a mentorship program. I have a community that's free uh, where I offer, you know, free classes and meditations and a sense of community for people. Uh, so I would um, love to meet more of you and be part of your journey. Now I will escape from the slides. Thank you so much, Kay. If people want to contact you, do they go to your website or do you want to give out an email? How, how does that work? I would rather have them go to my website. Have I stopped the share yet? No, I still see the... I still see it. You're getting lots of thanks in the chat box. And we do have some questions that I'm going to share with you. Okay. I would really like that, but I can't, uh, I've lost the button for stopping share. Oh, there it is. Yeah. On screen, sometimes layers upon layers. <laughs> mm. All right. Yeah. So the first question is from Navinka. And she wants uh, your advice on if a client responds saying something like, no, that does not describe me at all. Um, do you have any advice for how to respond to that? Yeah, yeah. In fact, sometimes in the beginning of a session, <clears throat> if I feel like a person is more passive, uh, 
I will even say to them, it's fine for you to interrupt me and ask me questions uh, or reflect on what I'm saying, whether it's something that really resonates with you and you have an example, or if it's something that you don't really agree with, because if you don't agree with it, then either we don't have the right birth time or chart, or I'm interpreting it the wrong way. And I want to know that so that I can understand you better. And so if someone says, no, that's not me at all, then I am <laughs> at that point in time saying, well, what is it about it that's not right? And again, as we know, since since you have this wide range of meanings on a planet and, and signs, they may be identified with one area that's a little different than the words you put in it. Or it may be something that's not happening for them yet. Like I have Mars in Sagittarius in the ninth house, ruling my chart with Aries rising. And for the longest time, when I saw other astrologers, they would say, oh, you must love foreign travel. And I would say, no, I've never, I've never really gone anywhere. And it was because I had children I was raising as a single mother. It's not that I wouldn't really want to go somewhere, but it was like not on my radar at all to foreign travel until much later. So those astrologers thought they were wrong. They also said, oh, you have Venus on the ascendant opposite Neptune. You must love to sing. Well, no, I was damaged by a choir leader when I was 13 who didn't like my deepening voice. And so I stopped singing and I didn't find singing again until I was almost 60. And I found Kirtan and fell in love with spiritual devotional singing. So there's another example. So you may be wrong as the astrologer and, you know, you can ask them about it or it may not be time for them to be aware of this yet. So. I, and the third option is, again, you, you maybe don't have the birth time, okay? So um, if it's the first two, you can just talk about it and see if you can figure it out. And if you just really can't figure it out and they're saying, no, I don't resonate with that at all, say, okay, well, we'll just leave that aside and, you know, move on. But if you're talking to them, like, I feel like in the first 10 or 15 minutes, the person I'm talking to should be resonating with at least 95% of everything I'm saying. And if they don't, I want to know why. So I have another example of this man I was working with and it just like it wasn't working. He didn't really resonate with what I was saying and the um, his career didn't line up like all the sort of markers of like who he was didn't line up with the chart. I said, where did you get the birth time? And he said, well, my, my mother told me. And I'm like, well, is she, you know, is she, do you think she's reliable with the time? He's like, well, I don't really know. I ended up adjusting his, his chart by two hours because it, you know, it matched who he was and finished off the reading. And he went home and got his birth certificate. And the time I adjusted it to was correct. And his mother was two hours off. So that's that's also something to be aware of. People don't realize how important the birth time is. And they often just like make it up and, you know, so, or their mother tells them or they kind of remember it. And your, your, your reading can be really off because of that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Charlene. And she says in her very first astrological natal reading, she was told that Pluto was making a transit and that, and then told to read the book of Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those readings. So the question is, is there another way to share about a difficult transit without simply saying it's going to be intense? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, when we share a difficult transit with a person, uh, our our goal state is to leave them with some co-creative action and what I call an ideal model of what this could look like when it's done. So I'll be looking at what what are the final outcomes if this person does this transformative work very, very well and point that out as, as the thing to work toward, to take the steps toward. And I like to work with the outer planet transits 
especially Pluto and Saturn, years ahead of when they're coming up. Uh, so, so that you, you look at what's happening and, you know, sometimes there's several transits happening or Pluto in one position is affecting a number of things that I will encourage people to either I give them the information or if they're more of an astrologer, I'll have them go to like even uh, Robert Hand's Planets in Transit and look at the, the potentials, but especially the positive potential and to understand that and to take conscious steps toward building that. And often with a Pluto transit, for instance, it's very good to do deep work, psychotherapy or shadow work of some kind. And, uh, but you, you need to know like what the underlying issues are, what, what is the specific type of shadow that you're working with. So for instance, right now, a lot of people have Pluto crossing Capricorn rising. And they have been so there are issues of uh, leadership and working too hard and, uh, you know, feeling uh, discouraged and blocked is is meant to be transformed into a true sense of power and leadership and by opposite to other people calling in cancerian nurturing uh, other folks to balance out, you know, that sort of that endless sense that it's all resting on me and I'm by myself as the mountain goat climbing up the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. The next question is from okay. Sharon, and it's a similar question, and she, she's wanting to understand better about how to broach sub, if she sees in a chart that there's like some anger or depression. Like, you know, do you bring that up? How do you bring that up? Um, what, what would you do if you saw some signatures like that? Mm -hmm. um, I bring them up as a question and as a possibility of how that is operating. A good example to me has been when I've seen people who have um, a moon Mars connection in some way. And you might wonder if that has something to do with the mother being angry but it can go both ways, right? It can be an angry, volatile mother. It can also be a mother with a lot of repressed anger and depression. And, and then there's also, and how is it for you with your, you know, your, your moon and your Mars? Is it emotional impulsiveness? You know, are you prone to anger? Are you prone to feel uncomfortable with your anger? So you can, you can ask the questions, uh, I love the word intense, as Charlene said, for uh, uh, Pluto, uh, Pluto and Scorpio, right? It's just like, oh, well, this looks intense or it looks like your childhood was intense here. Um, and then see if they come back, if they, you know, if they want to address it more deeply. So um, again, I take the client's lead and I, I feel like when you're doing your first reading for somebody and you're seeing these intense signatures, you, you don't want to avoid them and skip over them because that's not right. It's not, not integrity for what you're, you're seeing, but you also don't want to insist that they blab their whole experience in that moment to you, a virtual stranger. So by mentioning it lightly and saying, you know, we can explore this later if you want, then it gives them the opening to explore or or wait. You know, sometimes people come back uh, for another session and they'll say, yeah, you, you know, you mentioned this stuff last time and I, you know, really been thinking about it and now I want to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. This question is from Patricia who ask if you would give us some guidance to having close friends or family asking you to do a reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the potential of that changing the, the relationship dynamic as a result. Mm -hmm. um, for me with my close friends, um, if we're out, let's say we're out for dinner and they're asking me, oh, God, Kay, what's going on these days? It's just so hard. I, you know, their charts are memorized in my head. And I might say, yeah, you know, you're you're dealing with this right now where we're all dealing with, you know, this at this moment in time. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's time for you to come in and get a session for yourself. So I won't spend the dinner doing a reading for somebody. 
Um, but I keep I keep boundaries that way. And it, it's a it's a tough one. I don't know if I was starting out brand new. I don't know if I would do it the same way as I have done it. But, you know, after all these years, I mean, basically, like, like I said, I didn't know what I was doing 40 years ago. Uh, people just started coming to me. And so uh, my friends were some of the first people who came to me. And so I started doing readings for them. And then they referred people and, and it, it went from there. So I ended up with friends that I always did readings for. And, and then over the years, there's been a few people who are long-term clients who we've become quite friendly. Um, but I have to be really careful. We all have to be really careful about that and be sure that um it we we hold the boundaries necessary in the circumstance um it's it's fraught when when you allow a client to become a friend things are changing because they're never they're never really the same friend as some as uh somebody who you have no astrological connection with at all um so the the mindfulness of it, that's the most important thing is that you're very much aware of it. Uh, for family members, I have done readings for my adult kids over the years. Uh, I don't charge them at all. I but I charge friends uh, like a friend family rate. Okay. And and I'll say these these ethical questions are something that you know, you, you can choose a different way too. There's lots of astrologers who will not do readings for their adult children or their, um, you know, friends or ever become friends with clients. But, you know, most of us, like the people that I've been a, an astrologer to for 40 years and for them and then their kids when their kids were teenagers and now those kids are 50 and now I'm doing these, you know, for the, for the grandchildren. I mean, like I know those people so well it's not like, you know, I love them and it's not like it's a, a friendship like my best friend. But for instance, if someone in that family dies, I go to the memorial, you know, like that's I'm I'm part of their circle. And with doing readings for my my adult children, I am capable of completely disconnecting from who I am as a mother and being in sort of a spiritual state and just doing the reading. But I have also cultivated that in terms of the way I raise my children too, you know, and not controlling them and trying to fix them and, you know, just seeing them who they are as a soul. So they've, they've commended me on my ability not to be like a mom. <laughs> Frankly, mom, you did a very good job. <laughs> I thought it would be just like my mom telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of sounds too like it's a know know yourself, know thyself. And if if that's going to be a struggle, then maybe would you recommend that you know some people may be better off referring if if that's not a comfortable place. There's not like a right or wrong answer. In There's this. no right or wrong answer in that. I don't think, and it's not like you know, psychotherapists have very strong boundaries around that, right? They won't even go to a social event where they think one of their clients is going to be. And so keep those two parts of life separate. Uh, if I'm doing deep ongoing work with people with the psychosynthesis that I do, uh, I keep a much stronger boundary than if it's somebody who just comes in for a reading once a year. So, you know, for instance, recently I've started cultivating a friendship with a woman who comes, you know, once or twice a year, maybe, um, and has a therapist and, you know, is not relying on me in, in that way. Um, that I think, you know, so it's step by step, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is from Renata and she would like advice about a client who could be manipulative, who shows up and is seemingly mani manipulative in the session. Um, and I'll just, I'll read everything she says. That they, they subtly may unknowingly make pressure for you to tell them what they want to hear or to follow a certain path. And sometimes you feel trapped by the client. Do you have any advice on that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> 
um, that, you know, there are definitely a, a handful of people out there <clears throat> who want the answer they want and they'll come to you and they'll go to five other astrologers trying to get the answer as well. Um, I, I tend to, uh, restate what I've said in different words a couple of times and then I go to humor because I like humor anyway and uh and and so I'll just say I see what you're trying to do I see you're trying to get me to tell you that you're going to be in relationship with this guy but uh, that this is just not what I'm seeing right now this you know I'm telling you what I'm seeing and no matter how many times you ask me I'm not really going to change my answer so um, I'm just confronted yeah. Okay. Next question is from Diane, who would like to know if you use Placidus in your readings and if you check the whole sign chart as well to see if there's, you know, an overlap or do you adjust interpretation based on two different house systems? Mm -hmm. um, I use Placidus and I would say most people who do evolutionary and psychological astrology use Placidus. I know whole sign is used a lot these days, especially by people doing traditional astrology. Uh, to me, I where where I am inclined toward it is when outer planets come into a sign. I believe they really affect the house that's ruled by that sign. So, for instance, if somebody has, uh, let's say, right now, uh, Capricorn on the uh, seventh house cusp and Pluto moving toward that. From the time Pluto came into Capricorn, I would see and feel the beginnings of Pluto to the seventh house transit. But I generally don't look at the whole sign house unless the, the person, the client is into astrology and they use whole sign themselves. And then I'll open up the whole sign house and I'll I'll refer to both. I'll say, well, the way I look at things, this is happening. And the way you are looking at things, I imagine you're thinking this is happening. And then we'll talk about both. It's like they're, they're both valid in their own way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that just happened to me recently. I have to say, I always do a professional reading every year. And I didn't realize that the astrologer that I went to used the, the equal house system. And I've never used that system. And I opened myself up and I said, I'm just going to go with it. And it was uh, eye-opening. It was really great. And I'm really happy looking back because I was almost to the point to say, hey, could you use whole sign? And I didn't. So just to say, you know, it's uh -huh. really interesting to open up and hear a different perspective. Uh -huh. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The next question is from Sarah, who would like advice uh, on working with a person who isn't forthcoming and isn't validating whether the reading is on track or off track is do you have any advice for that um sometimes i have said you know it's really helpful if you can validate one way or the other you know like you'll get a better reading from me and we can go deeper if if i have a sense of clarity of where we're going with this but if if sometimes i just say okay you know and i just keep going and saying what i'm saying um i i don't get too many people who don't trust me anymore because really that kind of thing is usually coming from a place of trust um or they they feel like they're going to get a better reading if they don't talk and it's just you know you coming forward but um yeah i'm i had i have literally had one recently that gave no feedback at all just poker face until the very end and then went you know everything you said was right on like why did you do that to me it's so uncomfortable I was it was not it was not my best reading because there was no interaction and connectivity but that was what they did yeah okay and this is the last question this is from Sharon again who would like a book recommendation on how to handle difficult aspects or transits do you have any recommendations how to handle difficult aspects or transits. Hmm. No, no, that's that's the book I'm writing. 
<laughs> but I don't, I don't know that they're, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a book on evolutionary astrology as I, as I do it, which is really all about this co-creative approach to, um, you know, look at things ahead of time and, and have techniques to be able to work with things and come to the best possible outcome at the time of the actual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mary, do you know the the book we use in our Fundamentals One? Is it the Sue Tompkins book on aspects? Yes, there is a Sue Tompkins book used for RN one hundred and one. Yeah, so I think that one is the one that Kepler uses in our course. So I guess we you could say we recommend that book, Sue Tompkins, okay. and I think it's at aspects. I can't remember the exact yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, she wrote a book called Aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not home or else it would be sitting right there and I could look. So there you go. Uh -huh. All right. So that's it for questions. But I was thinking that, Kay, maybe you could talk a bit about the course that's coming up. Sure, sure. Uh, so the course, is, as you said, is a 10-week course. Uh, it was originally formatted by, by us at OPA um, and in loosely structured on the uh, ESAR, the International Society for Astrological Research, their consulting skills program, which Alexandra and I um, were both trainers for them. And so we created this for OPA and added a lot more in about diversity, inclusion and equity and um cross-cultural issues and the psychosynthesis piece that I do. And uh, it, it covers like all the things I talked about today are covered, but in a lot more depth. And as I said, it's, it's experiential to some degree. And what we'll do is uh, use these techniques to do actual readings with other people in the class so people get you know broken up into um, pairs and triads where um, one person's the astrologer one person's the client and one person's the observer and they work together and you don't have to you know your astrology does not have to be amazing to do this course we certainly welcome student astrologers as long as you know uh, the basics about signs, planets, aspects, and houses, even if you're not really great into chart synthesis. In fact, what it does is it gives you the confidence because since so much of what we're doing in the practices is active listening and, uh, you know, skillful communication and cultivating the empathy, that it's just a small amount of the astrology that you're even using. So you can just pick one thing, you know, if you're um, your partner asks you a question about something, you can just focus on one thing, one planet in the chart, because uh, we're not we're not evaluating it on the astrology at all. We're evaluating it on how are you handling the power dynamics and the communication and the listening and the the transitioning from the talking to the chart, you know, because you could be so skillful and smooth with that. It's very, very beautiful. So it's it's just it's a great course, and I would say that um, virtually a hundred percent people who have taken it have been uh, really enthusiastic about having done it. Whether they were newer astrologers or whether they've been an astrologer for thirty years, you know, the ones who've been astrologers longer were like, "Oh, I wish I had had this earlier." And there's all these pieces of this that I'm kind of doing, but not really knowing how I'm doing it or why I'm doing it. And now it all comes together. So that that's really um, people heal, honestly, taking this and then feel very confident and enthusiastic about doing the work. And the repeat business comes from this because when people feel cared for you're not just a talking head sitting there talking at them and telling them all this stuff that they don't even know about uh they they want to come back they want more because it's a unique experience in our world to have somebody you can go to who knows you so well and listens to you but also gives you this great level of information yeah yes well, we are very excited to have this course here at Kepler College, and mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we'll see some of you in the class. We have a mm -hmm. professional development certificate, which this course would uh, contribute 
credits towards. So, you know, that's one of the things that Kepler is continuing to, to develop is astrologers, not just your technical knowledge, but your professional knowledge. So I think that's it. We're going to wrap up this webinar. You will be able to see the replay on our YouTube channel. And we wish you all happy holidays. And we'll be back next year with more webinars. So thank you, Kay, so much for being here today. Thank you, Mary, for supporting. I'm Lori. I'm actually covering for Cal, who's usually here. So we'll we'll see you all next time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.